Welcome one and all, welcome one and all. This is the Corruption and Sport Lessons and Solutions for the Caribbean. Let me introduce everyone I've got with me. I've got Miss Carol Beckford. Miss Carol Beckford, most of you would know, has been involved with Usain Bolt for more than four years. She's also been involved in West Indies cricket in terms of marketing and, and giving other advice as well. And she is also the co-author of three books. One recently, the ABC of Caribbean Sports. So let me welcome her. Carol Beckford, welcome. We also got with us uh, Shaka Hislop. Shaka Hislop. And no need to give him an introduction, but I'm still going to introduce him because he went to college in Trinidad and Tobago, so I must introduce him. Former Trinidad and Tobago goalkeeper, the man who many acclaim, including myself, to have been the man of the match when Trinidad and Tobago got our solitary point in our only World Cup. He was the goalkeeper against Sweden. We were playing with 10 minutes, finished nil-nil. Shaka Islop has now gone on to be a renowned, renowned football analyst with ESPN and work all, works all over the world. But he is perhaps better known by many for being involved in show racism, the red card. Shaka, my friend, good, e good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me, Andre. Carol, let's first start talking about corruption in sport it's and when you take corruption in sport people normally only think about monetary corruption in sport but there are all different types of corruption there's match fixing as we know there's doping there's of course as spot fixing so many different types first from a caribbean perspective your concern about this whole corruption in sport uh thanks again for having us and i think the cdb has really done this the region a favor by having this discussion uh, corruption and this whole compliance about sports, for me, from my perspective, talks a little bit about governance, where the structures of our sporting federations need to actually uh, live up to the international standards. Because what is happening is that there is little accountability. But also from an academic standpoint, our, our universities across the board, across the region, need to refresh and review their courses that they teach under the whole brand of sport so that the youngsters who are coming out of college now can actually be able to relate to the people who they're either going to play with, work with, manage, um, and do even stuff like this. Because what is happening is that the information is not being taught in the schools and there are not enough conferences and workshops. So, you know, when you look at things like um, competition manipulation, you look at gender and, and, and sport, there are a number of issues for which corruption is placed. But I think administratively is probably one of the focus where sporting organizations need to have structures that allow for greater accountability. Carol, before I go to Shaka, do you feel, just as what you have just said, in terms of administration of sport in the region, do we as administrators in the, in the region follow our own advice or we sometimes look on at what happens elsewhere for instance what happens in football where people consider corruption to be the norm or what happens in horse racing where there's doping and it's the norm so administrators sometimes say well if the others are doing it and getting away with it why we in the caribbean should be different no the truth is, is that the industrialized countries that are bigger than us and we have to report to them will use the big stick approach so we have to be mindful of that um, the, the, the Caribbean has some issues with regards to things like comp competition manipulation, for example, where tournaments and so on are assigned. But I think because there's so much more money, I think in the last decade, they, there's been a thousand percent increase in terms of the access to, to money. And that in itself is one thing. So even when I, I mean, even when you look at you saying what you're saying earned back in his day as a young athlete. The truth is there's so much more money in all sports across the board now. And so we have to be careful how we help our athletes to manage that. And when it comes on later to the other part of the conversation, the intellectual property rights and so on. So there are a number of issues that we can that we can look at. Shaka, that leads right into this whole question about money. Money, money mm. is the root of all evil, many say, obviously, but many, all of us need money to survive in life. So how do you tell a young footballer or even a young administrator? Because most of the time when you talk corruption, people talk about administrators. All of footballers may be involved as well. What do you tell them, following on what Carol says, that we in the Caribbean, because our funding is so low as compared to the other countries, 
how do you tell somebody in the Caribbean, hey, this is how I make my living. I am going to try to make as much money as I can in the next five to 10 years, because even if they detect me and find out that I was on a substance, I would have made my money in 10 years and I would have made much more than I would have made being honest. Yeah, I think that that's a big challenge when you talk about corruption in sport, um, not, not just in terms of in terms of, of, of doping, uh, for, for performance enhancing, but also if, if you have a footballer, for, for argument's sake, um, let's say this team is middle of the table and not going to going to win the league, not going to not going to get relegated and, and um, book, bookmakers, gamblers offer him, you know, offer this player a, a certain amount of money to to, to ensure a certain result. Um, you know, he, he might feel very little conflict in that it's not going to affect his team's league position one way or the other. Um, so it, it's it's it, it's it's okay to, to to take that to take that money. I, I think the, the big challenge, and Carol is, is absolutely right. You, we have to administratively you you have to not only set an example, but you have to have checks and balances in in, in place in 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 managing um, all, all the different ways that that. That there they can be can be game manipulation. For me, you have to paint the, the bigger picture of what sport is, is all about to, to that young athlete. Not just paint the, the bigger picture, but provide provide those opportunities. I'll, I'll use myself as an example. Coming up as a as a, as a young man in Toronto Tobago, um, while while there was there was no TT Pro League at the time, there was no Major League Soccer. Um, the opportunity was in in, in education. So how do you use your, your position? How do you use your sport in, in getting that professional degree and using that as, as a platform for, for whatever the, the rest of your life may hold? Um, but you have to have those, those opportunities. I mean, you have to not just speak of those opportunities administratively. You have to seek them out. You, you have to, to, to detail the path for, for the young athletes so they can see how this sport outside of, of that result or outside of, of a bookie offering offering money to 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 um, to, to, to secure a, a, a certain result. Um, how that can take away from from what is the greater calling of, of, of their sport. Related to that, and related to the Caribbean, in terms of sanctions, I know Carl will be to touch more about it with Carl too as well. In terms of sanctions, would sanctions help? Meaning, if indeed the the young athlete can know that an offense will will result in a serious sanction rather than a slap on the hand because because of one major reason we in the caribbean will say we are not very talented as, as compared so we can't afford to drop this player and i use cricket as an example or a footballer or leave out this swimmer or leave out this 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 athlete because the team will be weakened and the athlete might know mm. hey i am so important that they will have to give me a slap on the wrist yeah, in, in my opinion, sanctions are important, but that that comes as as part of a, a of a bigger process in, in terms of in terms of oversight um, uh, and and just ensuring not not just in, in terms of um, financial corruption in sport, but but certainly as I mentioned, performance enhancing enhancing judge. Um, I think the challenge, and I'm sure Carol can speak to this better than I can. The challenge, particularly in in, in athletics and performance enhancing judges, in in terms of more individual sports as opposed to team sports such, such as such as, as as football is that medicine or the technology around performance enhancing seems to be outpacing the testing and, and that that is, is is a big challenge in 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 those sports so, uh, certainly in, in 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 that department how 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 do you keep up you know and and um if, in 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 a in an industry that that as i say seems to be outpacing the um the the, the field saves carl i want to revert back to you and and we did the track and field just as shaka mentioned of course being involved with you saint bolt you would have heard all these comments made by the opposition because they couldn't understand how a young man from the caribbean could be so good could achieve so much yet still he has done all of that how how, how difficult was it to live in that sort of environment where you have all these questions being asked of someone who is doing the right thing and then you are observing others who are doing the wrong thing still getting away with it well i mean you're saying was tested probably outside of himself and serena those at the time because i think they they were in peak of their careers because they had gatorade contracts together so mm -hmm. um 
there was a lot of interaction and we made some comparisons. They were tested more than any other athlete. I mean, Chaka mm -hmm. spoke to the science of it. The truth is, um, there are some people who are under more scrutiny than than the others. And so you're saying had no chance mm -hmm. at all to even make a mistake. There, there is a YouTube video out with himself and a Safa talking and, and, you know, Caribbean people or Caribbean sporting people probably should watch it because they spoke about the challenges. You're saying said when he started, he only had two weeks leave for the year. It's only when he became a mm -hmm. much senior athlete that he had four weeks. The truth is they work like regular people. And in the last 30 years, you'd have seen a progression where those athletes, in particular track and field and footballers, have, be have become more academically aware. They're doing courses, they're matriculating for colleges, and they're actually graduating with degrees. So the awareness with which they come to the table, knowing very well, one, have a team that supports you, but also be aware of the issues in the market. I mean, when you think of things like um, image rights and so on, a lot of the athletes now are so much more aware of what's happening. And so from that standpoint, I find that unless it's a genuine mistake or somebody wants to make, you know, make trouble, I think, no, the athletes are more aware. What has happened for somebody like in Shaka's um, demographic or age group is that the transition, we need to now be careful about how we help them into the transition from being a professional athlete into a professional. And not everybody can be a commentator, not everybody can be a coach. And so there are so many more options. And that is where there's a thin line which separates, for example, how, how long they stay in the business of being a professional athlete as opposed to making the switch. And there is always going to be some amount of temptation. But organizationally, you know, I'm into the administrative. I think as sports administrators, we have to be so far ahead of the game that we have to be giving them advice and offer the the right regulations, policies, and protocols so that they can fit in. Because what happens if, if we don't have the structures to support the rules and regulations, then it's going to go wild. So the sanctions as opposed to, sanctions can work, but it has to be clear. And so we can't afford sanctions based on, uh, based on a feeling. It has to be a clear cut rule. I mean, even how we select players on the team, you know, West Indies cricket is probably the worst when it comes on to selection. I mean, the football teams have a better idea. But the truth is, it has to be in black and white. And if we don't, we have tests, we have standard tests. And if you play certain positions, this is how you get in the team and so on. So it really is about being black and white and what the rules are and regulations. Interesting to talk about administrators because I know Shaka talks about that too as well. And you say you are an administrator. In the Caribbean, I've heard many persons, and I, I'm you trying to make us an example, many administrators say, and Shaka knows this as well, say that they are doing this job voluntary. So in other words, they're not being paid for this job. So we can't demand so much of them. You've just said that they should put things in place, but they're going to tell you that they are here part-time as far as they know, right? Many of them may be here for trips to go abroad or to travel as it can be because they're not being paid. So how you deal with that, Carl? Because we don't have professional administrators, and it's not in Trent and Tobago in many of these sports. Some of the sports, all right. Let me use Jamaica as an example. Our top, and I'll probably use four, is football, cricket, track and field, and netball. All right, so those are the four sports, and most of our corporate people tend to invest enough money in those. The truth is football is still the most popular sport. And without a good investment in your football brand, then there's not enough money to throw around. We have a sports development foundation in Jamaica that gets money from the lottery. So we actually have something that uh, more or less decides what kind of allocations the sporting bodies get. But the truth is a lot of money is being invested in sport, but a lot more is still needed because the programs have now become so complicated. And if you're in, we have to have policies and guidelines, whether you're volunteering or not, the rules still apply. That's the truth. The rules still apply because you can't just willy nilly just be running a sport because it's no, we're not doing it out of our cars and, 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 and living rooms anymore. And so the international rules apply. 
So that is no excuse because when you get to an international competition, the rules kick in. I mean, before even one of your athletes qualifies for an international race, whether it's a swimmer or a hockey player or even a referee, you, you must run certain amount of miles, you must do certain amount of matches. There are rules and regulations. So, that, I mean, tough luck if you're volunteering. We all did it, but times have changed. No, but it's the truth. I mean, when I look at West Indies cricket, for example, and I use the, um, Ghana, Haynes, Greenwich, and those guys, they never, the kind of investment that was, that's in cricket now wasn't there. But they have converted either into coaching, broadcasting, and so on. And they're earning from, from the proceeds of what is happening now. And so as the generation changes, things are going to change. I mean, look at the gear. Look, look at how track and field and even football gear has evolved. I mean, you can now run probably the, gear, the kind of gear that Shaka played in. The, the teams now are using dry fit and all different kinds of things have evolved. So, I mean, let, let me tell you, volunteering is no longer an excuse for, for stupidity. That, that's can, can I can, can I just yes. add to that, Andre? Can I just add to that? I, I, I'm in full agreement with everything Karoja Car just, just said there. I, I, absolutely. I've I've been advocating for quite some time about. Um, I, I I have been I, I've been against the the voluntary voluntary nature of 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 administration, and and Carol rightly points out how much how much every every other aspect of sport has changed. Whether we're talking. Um, e equipment or, or how, how we understand nutrition, every other aspect of, of sport has changed. But I, in, in many instances in, in, in the Caribbean, ad administratively, um, we, we've kind of stagnated and, and we've approached, the, we, we, we've approached with, with the cliche that this is how it's always been and it's always worked for us, so, so why change now? Now, first of all, I, if somebody's volunteering, you can't tell them they're doing a bad job, in, in my opinion. Because they're volunteering, you, you get what you pay for, and and if you, if you, if our uh, football, if the people at the head of our uh, of our uh, uh, football uh, or sporting administrations yes. uh, are, are volunteering, how how can you tell them that they're doing a bad job? I think it, it also that that lack of of um, that 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 lack of 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 them being accountable to 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 the football to or to the sport. I keep saying football. Excuse me. To to the sport su supporting public um, provides opportunity, if not opportunity, certainly excuse for abuse of of their positions. And 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 that's what we've we've seen time and time again. And and there are examples up and down the Caribbean. Um, some some more recognized than others, but it's happened every single way in, in the Caribbean where where that kind of attitude continues continues to, 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 to dominate in our sport. So we, we have to evolve administratively as the sport has 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 evolved itself. Well it could, because that that's I think the point I was relating to the fact now that we have a situation whereby if I am a volunteer in football Let's see, and I am the president. And most of the organizations, as far as I know, in terms of the Caribbean, they're all volunteers. The president is a non-paying job, as far as I'm aware. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the temptation is there. So how do we change that thing? And I know Carol says that the volunteer system, but the people are still doing it. People are looking for positions because they are seeing that as a, a way to benefit themselves. Not many times to benefit the athlete. Well, I, I think you have to you have to have these um, you have to have these jobs as as paying jobs because yeah. first of all you want to you want to attract the, the best administrative talent. Um, it, you cannot uh, attract the, the best minds in the business if if it, if you're not paying them for, for their efforts. Um, you know if 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 a, if a manager is offered a job in a bank for argument's sake, yes. um, and and uh, has to decide between that and and, and a, a sporting position that that's voluntary. He's going to he's, he's going to go to the bank. Um, so you, you just in in an effort to, to, to be competitive, you have to have those those those, those jobs paying and, and 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 pay pay competitively. And and Carol's to, to Carol's point, there is money in sport, and I, I think the corporate sector does want to support um, sport in in a more meaningful way than, than than maybe they have been. But they also have to have something to believe in. Um, while our, our sport and, and through its voluntary nature has, has kind of uh, allowed for, for 
a, a lot of corruption, which we've seen, and, and we've seen mushroom over the years. Those corporate organizations don't want to put their money into, into sport or a sport where they're not quite sure where that money is going. There's a lot of room and speculation about corruption within that sport, or at least administratively. And so they don't want to, they don't want to align themselves with that brand. But having been on certain, in, in some, of those con some of those conversations, there's also an expectation from sports, certainly in the Caribbean, there's an expectation that the corporate bodies will invest in sports. And my own experience in, in, in Europe and the US is the exact opposite. They build a brand, to, to it, the, the, the phrase that, that Carol just used, they build a brand around sport that was attractive to, to corporations, to, to, to that investment. Whereas we in the Caribbean feel that corporations have a duty to invest in sport, and we then try to build a brand around that. We were far too often put in putting the card before the horse. Um, Shaka has just opened the door for my, my next point. We realize that we have talented people in the region and it's not just, and it's not just sports, it's entertainment, right? Mm -hmm. And I think based on some policies that we have started to create, let me be very honest, I think Trinidad, Bahamas and Jamaica are way ahead and Barbados are way ahead in terms of De developing policies that are attractive to corporate. It has to be a business. And so if I'm getting money from a corporate company, there must be incentives. But let's talk about those policies. An athlete has a potential lifespan of somewhere between 10 to 15 years at the professional level. Th there, even things like taxes and so on, there has to be things that keep keep them honest. And so there won't be any corruption. Because I guarantee you not all athletes declare earnings and, and so on. And so we realize that this is one of our mainstay in the region. So as governments and as policymakers, and I hope the CDB can influence CARICOM to talk about these things. These are some things that I've been talking about for ages. If this is one of our driving force for economic activity, there must be incentive programs and policies that are geared towards athletes and artists. So the, it's no different from Michelle versus Usain. Mm -hmm. It's no different from Chris Gill and those guys that are out there, 10 to 15, sometimes 20, some go a little longer, but it's still not the lifespan of a doctor and engineer and so on. So we have to create our own situations that will benefit our people. Believe you me, I remember the West Indies cricketers back in the day were in the top five percentile paid people in the region. So there is a mm. lot of money. But guess what? They, they pay the same duty at customs. I mean, you. I'm sure Andre and Shaka, you yeah. guys know, yeah. if I'm to bring in a ball, what the issues are and so on, and as opposed to medical equipment. So, you know, we have to treat sport as a business. We have to see it as an academic activity. We have to see, we have to see it as a, as a type of earning for a significant portion of our people. And we also have to create um, room for our people to manage our business. And so the incentives have to be there. I, I think that's a key point. I think that's a key point there, Carol. I, I, it's, when, when we're talking about sport or, or, or entertainment, and there, there's a whole industry that goes, goes on be, behind these. We, we so often just focus on the athlete. On, on, and, and, and to that point, the athlete at the very top of, 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 of the tree, the, the Usain Bowles, uh, the Dwight Yorks, when there is, is, is so much more, and, and again, in, in an industry that, that continues to evolve. So for instance, um, image rights. Now image rights wasn't, wasn't a concern to me when, when I was playing because it wasn't something that was you know, properly or fully understood, even, even in Europe. But, it, but it's, a major, it's a major driver for, for athletes now in, in terms of in terms of how they how they're compensated your intellectual property when you, if we're talking about entertainers um again that that is something that is something new that is something new to to, to, to the industry that we have kind of relied on um people on the outside to to to, to recognize and and to 
to, to educate us on. I, 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 I know a young lady in Trinidad, Carla Paris, um, who, who's a, a, a intellectual property lawyer. And, and th this is her niche and this is her understanding. And the more we understand the industries and the mechanisms behind what goes into, and I'll, I'll, I'll frame it all entertainment because sport falls under, under, under that umbrella. The more we understand and the more we can have, the more we as West Indians can have direct impacts into those industries and how it affects our entertainers, be they sport, music or, or otherwise, I think the, the better we'll see those industries grow. All right, so uh, let me know if we have a question from uh, what the audience. Let me read it. What about the reputational impact of corruption on young players who want to play fair and clean but are governed by corrupt oversight bodies? I don't know why I feel I should ask Shaka his of that question. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so, not because you're in Qatar, eh? not because you're in Qatar, not because you're in football, uh, but, but go ahead. Listen, I, I think example is, is a powerful thing. And, and to the question, it is very difficult to say to a young person, um, you know, walk the straight and narrow, do, do, it, do it this way, this way, and this way, when you see people at the, at the very top of the administrative tree um, benefiting in a way that, that, that's, that, that, um, that contradicts everything that, that you've, you've become, that you know about the sport. But, you know, we, we've spoken about the need to, to have, um, to have our, our administrative positions be professional positions um, and competitively so, and they to be to have, have to be held to account because the, the one thing I've, I've, I've learned in, in, in my years in, in, in sport as in life, you can only rely on the good nature of, of people to go so far. Not everybody is, is, is going gonna, is gonna to share your sense of, of values, your sense of morals. Others are, are going to interpret that same set of, of rules and guidelines uh, are differently in, in a way in a way that benefits themselves and, and, and in a way in, in all honesty that that they can often defend very well which 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 you've seen again to that point about about volu voluntary uh, ad administrators how do you say to someone who is um sharing the company of as as one football administrator in Trinidad and Tobago likes to boast, sharing the company of, of, of royalty the world over, of prime ministers the world over, of being in the room when million dollar deals are, are being negotiated and everybody else is, is taking million, million dollar kickbacks and you're here as a volunteer. How, how do we reasonably expect them not to benefit not to, or, or not to be tempted? To, to, to benefit similarly. So there, there has to be major oversight um, in, our, in, our, in our administrative processes and our administrators in much the same way that we are calling for oversight in our athletes and, and how they, how, how they, they participate. Carol, yeah. take, take, take a run at it, take a run at it. I know it's tracking people, but go ahead. No, can I tell you, in 30 years, they, 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 they the money has changed or the money has increased in terms of even at the volunteer level, to be honest. What I got as a per diem as a young uh, volleyball president back in 2001, that per diem has probably tripled. And the truth is there are, more, there, there are so much more money available even at the volunteer level. So, I mean, the temptation shouldn't be that great. And as Shaka rightly said, when it comes down to rights images, as an athlete, you could possibly make more money. Let us say you're an average cricketer and your average is 30, 40 runs, whatever. Basic like and you play. Like, like you can't rest in this team. No, no, no. I'm talking about <laughs> a, a personality. Okay, you, can, so. you can make a good amount of money being an influencer on Instagram in addition to what you make on the track if you have that kind of personality. So it's no longer just the footballer or the cricketer or the netballer or the swimmer, there is so much more you can earn now. So the temptation really shouldn't be all that great. No, but but but, but Carl, Mr. Pede, is it I, I hear you, but I want to fall back on this. How many of our young athletes know that? How many of them know that that they can do this? We we, we might think they, they know it they know it easily, but there's so much other temptations in front of them, easy temptations that they might think this is the easy option rather than to do what you've just said. No, but all right. 
maybe Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago have a little different because we no longer, our borders are, you know, very close these days. The truth is, when you have an athlete in Jamaica that shares a brand with Serena or Kevin Garnett or mm -hmm. any one of those cricketers, um, New Balance, you know, those guys, and you're playing with them and so on. Yeah, you're playing against each other on the field of play and on the track and so on. But you share some of the same brands. There's no excuse. I'm say and I'm saying that with all the love in my heart, there is no excuse. Get yourselves a good attorney, a good accountant, and support and a good marketer. There is no excuse. There is so much money out there, but you just have to be smart about it. And uh -huh. that's the issue. You have to be smart and trust, as Shaka said it. And I mean, I want to reiterate, there are enough of us in the region, from the region, that can get you the same deals that some of the people in Europe are getting us. And I know Carla, because I worked with her for a film festival I did last year. We need to start trusting our own people. Mm -hmm. I'm not against I'm not against diversity and so on, but there are enough of us in the region who can get you the same deals or even better, get you in the same boardrooms, get you contracts, get you films, all of that stuff. There are enough of us in the region. And after Trinidad and us are 60 years, we need to start trusting our own people. But, but and, and to, to, to that point, to that yeah. point, Andre, can I, if I could just yes, add, sure. also for, for that for, for those young young athletes or, or musicians um, who cannot afford or may not be able to on their own afford a, a, a lawyer and, and uh, a manager and an accountant, et cetera. Um, and listen, I, I, I also benefited from being a member of the Professional Football Association in England, which comes with being a professional. You, you, you have to opt out of, of being in, 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 the, in the PFA. Um, and, and those services come as part of, of that membership. Now, I can speak from a, a first hand, my own frustrations are trying to, to, to get um, trying to be a football as unionized in, in, in that way. Not that, not, not to, in, in, in just understanding that every single player, regardless of how much or how little you earn, often needs that, that, that professional advice, whether it's an accountant just to make sure you're filing your taxes properly, or whether it's an, a, a, a financial advisor just to make sure you invest in, 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 the, right, in, the, right, in, in the right investment vehicles, depending on what your life plans are. It may be that you want to go to university after you finish playing, after your playing career. It might be that you want to start a business. Um, those are very different asks for, for in terms of in terms of how how you invest, and the, these players need need to have that advice. But oftentimes, on on their own, they either, they're not quite sure if they can afford it. They're not quite sure where to turn, who to trust, and having having. Um, that network, as as a, as a as I had in in the PFA to, to lean on, is also something. And you talk about the evolution of, of sport. Um, I, I think it's, it's sorely needed um, and, and and long overdue. But because of our lack of understanding of exactly what um, unions of, of this kind do and offer to to to, to entertainers. Um, there, there has been a lot of resistance to it, and we just haven't been able to get off the ground. Yeah, we have some more questions. Chaka, this one I think is directly for you. What do you think will be the legacy of the FIFA and Jack Warner scandal on regional football? Um, I, I think we've already recognized uh, so some of some of that some of the legacy issues. Um, so immediately following Jack Warner, Jeffrey Webb became became Concacaf president. Um, so you have two presidents back to back, both black men from the Caribbean, both swept up in 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 that in in, in that scandal, um, and as a result, I, I think regionally, I, I, in terms of Concacaf, there was a lack of trust, um, a lack of trust around Caribbean administrators. Um, I know very well Larry Musseldon from 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 Bermuda lawyer by, by, by training himself, above board, incredibly intelligent. I, I thought he would have made an incredible CONCACAF president to, to succeed Jeffrey Webb, but because of, of the legacy of, of both Jeff Webb and, and, 
and, and Jack Warner, I, he didn't stand a chance. And, and as a result, you now have uh, Victor Montagliani, who's you know, done a good job at, at, at CONCACAF. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure what, what, what his position is in terms of, in terms of contenders for, for that post. I'm, I've separated myself by design from, from what's been happening in, 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 in world and CONCACAF football. Um, but I, I don't anticipate, despite, despite the political strength of the Caribbean nations within CONCACAF, I don't think we'll see another CONCACAF president from the Caribbean or, or the CFU for quite some time. So we, we, we are living that legacy. We are still hoping that people take notice of the Caribbean. We are not, we are not in a position to advocate for ourselves. And, and I, I, for me, that, that is a desperate position for us to be in, but that's a position that we have found ourselves in because of, of, of the legacy of, of, of those two people. Longer term, I, I'm, always, I'm always a glass half full guy, kind of guy. I, I always say that. I hope that um, what has happened forces change, not just in, in Caribbean or CONCACAF football, but forces change in world football, in recognizing how easily the, the system can be perverted or has been perverted. And how you need to have those checks and balances to better serve, better serve the, the global game, in particular in growing the game in some of the smaller corners of world football. Carol, this one is for you. There, there are many youths who have no interest in sports because they've had a big, single bad experience with losing a game or money to corrupt officials. How can governments help them should government step in and take control of certain sports? No, uh, political interference in, in sport is, is not recommended. Uh, government is to set policy for all industries of which sport is one of, is one of them. I think what should happen, as I said, we realize that the Caribbean has sport and entertainment as two valuable uh, economic activities. And earlier, I think I saw a question about how early should they start, as, as early as they're in first form in high school. CXC managed to have um, physical education as a subject in, in CSEC and CAPE, and that's a pretty good start. But pretty much like financial literacy and all those other things, those things are to start early. Because there are 14 year olds who probably earn um, own more stocks than I can. So if they're doing it for other things, why not start there? I mean, it's, sports is a massive business. When you look at, for example, the, the when you look at the the uh, broadcast rights for all these fabulous sports that we like to watch, if you're even on one uh, percent of that in terms of hosting an event and so on, there is money out there to be made. What I think we're not doing, we're not organizing ourselves well in this region, and I'm saying it again for reiteration. Um, CDB, I mean, I know they're the host, but they're in a very good position to offer seed or and or mobilization money for sports businesses. And probably this is where it needs to start. Because I, I think, again, as, as good as we have done and as great as our athletes have impacted on the world, I don't think we realize that how to convert that into meaningful businesses for us. You know, we need to start developing things like our sports apps, getting things into technology. Mm -hmm. um, we need to host more events. You know, we re event hosting is a big thing. We need to fill our hotel rooms and sport tourists are some of the most sophisticated tourists. I mean, Chaka is down in Qatar. Those people have saved their life earnings to be in Qatar to watch the World Cup. And if we can get 10% of those people to come to the region for everything we have the best beaches we have the best venues and so on but more of this need to be taught in schools i mean i did sciences at school and that was great and i probably still remember the periodic table but my son studied other things and he's probably in another two years could be earning way more money than i am because of he's doing three or three or four little things that i wouldn't dare do when i was his age because you are told to specialize. No, mm. we have got to be more flexible with, it, with our people. 
and stop telling our children that if you do film and sports and all those things, you know, you're pretty much worse. There's no, no. Uh, so I think it's a whole re-engineering, a re-education and that whole thing. But at the same time, encourage people to get involved in the business of sports in the Caribbean. Well, okay, so, and, and that leads to a, a question for both of you all. Here, and again, again, I'm going to use Trent to as the example. I think it exists all over. The, many of us believe that government, whoever the government is, doesn't understand that sports is so integral and important. Whether it's important because of crime, whether it's related to corruption, that having people invested in sports helps a country. Uh, let me start with Shaka. Shaka, that's something that you know in Trinidad Tobago. We've been trying to drive home to many of the governments. They come and they go, and they talk a good talk. They all talk mm -hmm. the talk that they love sport and they'll invest in sport. And when the budgets are released, sports get the sports at the bottom of the table. Obviously, Carol and Shaka. Yeah, and listen, I, I I totally agree. I I understand the value of sport to to to, to a country to to. A, to, to young people and having not not just having access to those sports as, as participants, but how it also drives uh, a, a pride, pride, pride in your team, pride in your nation. I'm, I'm witnessing that my, myself out, out here in, in, in Qatar. Um, and so it, it does deserve to, to, to be a, a meaningful line item um, in, 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 in government budgets. Um, but there also has to be, I, I, there also has to be oversight in how, how that government money is spent. Carol, Carol is right. Sport is an industry in itself. Um, and while governments direct um, how industry is to be run, um, when if they're investing directly into, into, into sport administrations, there has to be a, a, a certain level of accountability. And without that accountability, you, it, it's, it, it's also right for, for corruption. But I, I'm also a little bit understanding of of the economic times um and we we're, we're from small countries the caribbean is made up of a series of small countries we do not have the kind of um disposable income that the u.s or, or european nations have yet we we are competing on on the exact same fields or tracks or stadiums however however you you want to phrase it but i think from a, a larger governmental perspective there is incredible value to have to having young people be involved and invested in sport. We I, I've, I've always been a little bit critical as to how much of of our focus has gone into athletes at the very top of the pyramid. We we don't give enough credit. We don't pay enough mind or give enough support to to our grassroots sports. And I think that's where it has, that, that's where it has the greatest impact in terms of, um, in terms of outcomes as far as, as, as far as, as, as governments, as far as governments are concerned. We'll all celebrate when you see in bowl wins a, wins, wins a gold medal. But if you can use sport, just as an example, and recognize a downturn in crime figures, that, you know, we, we may not all celebrate on, on a single day. We may not, you know, all, all, all be cheering, but that has, um, that has a far more outsized impact on who we are as a nation. And, and, and that's a common problem we, we have both in Jamaica and Trinidad in terms of crime. Carol, let me ask you this question, because you, you spoke about the advancement. You spoke about how things have changed from, from our time to, to now. Do you feel that because of technology, because of advancement, corruption in sport is easier now than it would have been 25, 30 years ago? Oh, certainly. I mean, with the, with the access, with more access, there's more opportunity. But then it, it is, there must be accountability with the same kind of gusto. So in other words, I mean, back in the day, we had tiered structure where we had first vice president, second vice president, and all those fabulous things. They're going flatter in terms of governance, mm. and they're encouraging professionals. So the volunteer thing, I mean, at the global level, and even in some jurisdictions, are not being encouraged. And if you notice, no, no, um, I'm not picking on any profession, but if you notice, more attorneys are getting into, into sports. And But I also think that there is more... Everything, anyway. 
<laughs> anyway, 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 anyway. Um, I have two cent boys. Um, good, good, good afternoon to you. But go ahead, go ahead. And no, but you know what though, we we, the truth is, as I said, I think we have our own little industry that we can. When I look across the region or globally and look on television, I see my Caribbean people represented on and off the field. When I get into some boardrooms, I see them in there. But we there there is something that just doesn't connect. And regrettably, I pick on CARICOM all the time. CARICOM must be that place where all of this is assembled. There's no one government that can, Trinidad can get all their people, Jamaica can get all their people, but we're, we're small, and Chaka is right. We are small. English-speaking Caribbean is probably, we don't even read 7 million people yet. Mm. And we're here, um, you know, boxing above our weight class. Mm. And, and so probably that's the issue. But the truth is we have enough influence on and off the field. And if we can get, if we can get us together to manage the next 30 years in this industry, we'll be good. I mean... When you look at Marshall, Marshall went to the Brooklyn Net Stadium and, and I mean, he literally mm -hmm. cleaned up New York. It's no different from the Brooklyn Nets playing the Boston Celtics and, and filling the stadium. A, a full stadium is a full stadium. And so for me, I want us to be able to maximize on those opportunities. The, 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 the only difference is that when they leave, when the, when the fans leave, by Marshall, they're all happy. I'm not too sure the fans are all happy when they say the Celtic win the next stadium. I'm not too sure that happened at Madison Square. I'm not too sure. I'm certainly. Mm -hmm. yeah, so from your perspective, in terms of in terms of CARICOM involvement, we always hear, and Carol knows this, he involved in cricket West Indies. The CARICOM prime ministers always talk about their love of cricket. All of them love cricket. They, wa they, they watch cricket all the time. Yes, still, it hasn't helped. And I'll be honest, hasn't helped West Indies cricket. Yeah, listen, I, I, I am ill-equipped to talk about to talk about cricket. I, I'll be really honest with you. Um, I, I think cricket continues to hold incredible value for for, for the region in, in yes. how we identify as, as a region. While football, we we use football in in, in that team sport perspective uh, more from an individual country's how 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 we, we sell ourselves individually. The Caribbean is how we sell ourselves regionally, and and, and it really is a. a a sibling kind of relationship between between all, all of those Caribbean countries. Um, and, and you're right. I, I think we've, because of the nature of the sport, um, too often we found ourselves squabbling about, you know, who should be in or too many players from such and such a nation. And, and I, I think that that takes away, that takes away from, from the sport. It takes away from what what it means to, to represent and and it, it does drive a wedge between between what as i described as as, as a sibling rivalry be, be, between nations and, and that for me is something that is is difficult to to is difficult to, to put a figure on what the solution may be how do we how do we better um embrace ourselves both our our, our successes and and, and, our, and our feelings regionally as opposed to as as we have been doing pointing the finger I, I, pointing the finger accordingly that, that was you in job that was the university of the west in his job the yeah. whole we see ourselves as and i guess they dropped the ball because mm. you know and i hate i hate to say this but certainly when i was a child you had to come to trinidad to be an engineer mm. or go to barbados to be an attorney oh, yeah, and yeah. finish in jamaica mm. And then you come to Jamaica to be a doctor or, or a journalist. No, you can get that anywhere. So there are more Caribbean students meeting at Miami Dade in Miami than they are in the region. And, and just to get back to that, those are some of the issues with regards to not trusting our own. Because if we're not collaborating on the traditional parts, we're into intra and inter university games. I mean, outside of character track and field, a young Caribbean athlete doesn't know each other until they participate at a certain level. So there are certain things that have been pulled. You know, there are more schools who will probably run over to Miami to go to the Miami Classic in several sports. There's a Miami Classic in every sport that we play in the region now. And I know there, there is intra-regional travel issues and so on, because there are expenses. 
And I think as a region, we have taken away from ourselves the thing that made us together. So it's more expensive to come down to Guyana or to Trinidad and Tobago mm -hmm. than to go to Miami. I can go to Miami three times for the same money. I fly down to Trinidad and Tobago or Guyana. And, and that's part of the craziness because I can go watch a Miami Heat game. Why shouldn't I come down to Trinidad and watch a, a football Can, game? I'm just going to stop it briefly because we've been joined by <laughs> Professor Declan Hill for this short period. And I, I want to take the advantage we have because he has been described as one of the world's foremost experts on match fixing and corruption in, in international sport. Um, Professor Hill, thank you for giving us some of your time. And of course, we were touching about the whole aspect of corruption in sports. We don't have much time, I know, with you. But your overall opinion on where corruption in sports is now, one of the questions we asked the panelists is, over the last 20 years, has corruption in sports increased and why? Uh, look, first of all, my apologies, both to yourself and our studio um, uh, panel for uh, only joining us in the last 10 minutes. I'll make it short, I'll make it fast and, and, and powerful. Athletes in the Caribbean have been systematically betrayed by corruption. The, it's really difficult to overstate how corrupt and incompetent sports governance is in the Caribbean. I'm going to start with two premises. One is that the Caribbean athlete measures up to the best in the world. I, I'm, I, you know, right here we have Shaka Hislop, who is a world-beating champion athlete, and I'd like to really emphasize that Shaka's attributes and his skill and talents are not isolated. He's not the only brilliant athlete to come from Trinidad and Tobago. You look at the guys from Jamaica, you look at guys from Barbados, Antigua, uh, Bahamas, right across. The West Indians cricket team used to be the world's best champions. And they've been systematically undercut by the corruption and incompetence of Caribbean sports governance. One example that there's myriads that I'm sure our listeners and our viewers can say, the Jamaican football, soccer, National Football Association can't even bring their team home. They can't even book return tickets. I'm not suggesting the Jamaican National Football Association is corrupt, but I am saying they're incompetent. And that kind of incompetence is myriad in Caribbean. So let's not be nice about this. Let's not be soft selling. We are experts in corruption and compliance and cybercrime. And we How got can we change that? How can we change that? We can start telling the truth. We can stop mm -hmm. being nice. We can stop the politeness. And um, a tremendous respect for the Caribbean culture, the, the, the sense of brotherhood and sisterhood, the respect you give people. But it's time to start, given the governance in Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, around the Caribbean, stop the free ride for them. But and I'm glad you joined us here. One of the questions we addressed earlier Professor Hill, is because in most of these organizations, the persons will tell you, the presidents in Trinidad and Tobago, in Jamaica, and some of that they are doing this voluntary. They are not being paid. So therefore, any benefits they get, we can't be against them because they are using their own time. How do you respond? Well, you can tell I'm laughing. I, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> laughing. I mean, this is a multi-million dollar business. FIFA, the World Cup, you know, um, um, I mean, look, you had the guy out of Cayman Islands who took money from Jack Warner. I'm not even going to get into Warner's uh, contributions to sports governance around the world. I won't touch that subject. Our readers and listeners know enough about that. But the Cayman guy was taking cash for youth football development in Cayman Islands and spending it on strip bars in Atlanta. In one night, he spent $25,000. Tell me. Please tell me that the fundamental system of Caribbean sports governance has changed in the last few years. And I will say, I'm sorry, it hasn't. And so this idea that people out of the goodness of their heart are doing that. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I join you. I join our listeners in saying, come on, guys. All right. So, so let me ask you this. So let me ask you this before I go back to the panelists quickly. Professor Hill, is the Caribbean any different to other countries? Is the Caribbean different to Canada? Is the Caribbean different to the USA, to Mexico, to South America? Absolutely. And I'll tell you why. Because I believe, as Shaka Hislop does, we've had many conversations about this, is the Caribbean athlete is one of the best athletes in the world. 
You know, you go to a Jamaican regional high school track and field championship, and you're going to see some of the best runners, the best track people you've ever seen anywhere in the world. I'm Canadian. I, I you know, I don't like to admit this, but I don't think our <laughs> athletes in track and field, in football, certainly not in cricket, are at your level. So you have these world-class athletes and your system, not you, Mr. Baptiste, but the governing <laughs> Caribbean is systematically betraying them. So before you go, now CounterCAF has a Canadian man in charge. Is that good or bad? Uh, I, I wish I could say it's good. Um, Touche, my dear friend. Um, look, this is a guy who said he learned everything about the management of football business from Seth Blatter's former people. This is his quote, you know, that he learned stuff, everything that he knew about football business from Seth Blatter's administration. I, I'm sorry. Um, there are many good administrators in Canada. I don't think that chap is one of them. All right. Interesting. Carol, as we go, solution. What, what solutions have we? we? We heard a lot from Mr. Hill. In that short time, he's made a massive impact. Um, what, what solutions are there? Re revise the policies and programs that help with the regulation. Uh, have an independent body of sorts. I was hoping it would have been CARICOM, but have an independent body of sorts that will seek out the likes of people like Shaka, um, myself, uh, Dwight York, all those people, Russell Latape, Brian Lara, all those people who are 50, well, I'm not dating myself, but certainly the more mature people and have them assemble how how we can maximize the opportunities in, in the sports. My, my first book spoke about core sports. We're still very popular at cricket, football, track and field, basketball, and netball. Those are the five that the, the Caribbean has impacted the world on tremendously. Boxing needs to return and then get into some, and then put together a, an event hosting package of sorts that will not just benefit the Astis, but benefit the industry. And I think thereafter, the next 10 to 15 years, we can see where the Caribbean will will be back as, as, a, as a point of, of entry for sports business. Can, can I also add to that? Can I also add that, Andre? I think we also have to revise how, how we elect and promote uh, administrative o o officials. And I, I say that to make this one point. In my times in, in being involved, both in Toronto Tobago football, in CONCACAF football, people I know within FIFA, those organizations employ some incredible people, people who have the best sport at heart, yet those are not the ones who make it to the C-suites. Those are not the ones who are tasked with making decisions. You have incredible people trying to make a difference and their efforts are continually betrayed I'll, I'll, I'll use dr hill's word those their efforts are continually be, betrayed by those people who are somehow elected that also has to be revised in in how we promote those people with the sports best interests at heart to have them lead those organizations not just those who can do behind behind the back in the shadow deals to get themselves elected. Professor Hill, as we go, I, I, I want to piggyback on, on one of your books, The Fix. What is The Fix? How can we fix this? Not, 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 what, not that your book, you know, but I'm using your book. How can we fix what, what, what we are discussing? Well, we can start by firing incompetent people. Mm -hmm. And, and there's, a, there's a tolerance in places in the Caribbean to tolerate incompetence. I mean, frankly, when you leave an entire National Football Association, as the Jamaicans did twice in foreign countries, be it Guyana or Mexico, the entire National Football Association has to be fired. You know, there's no excuse for that kind of stupidity. How can you not buy a return ticket for your football association team? Like, how can you not do it? So I think we've got to take some stuff stances and we've got to be able to look at our young Children, our young athletes who are coming up, be it in Jamaica, be it in Trinidad, Tobago, Antigua, Barbuda, wherever across the Caribbean, saying, we're on the line. We're fighting for you. We're making sure that you're not going to be betrayed. But 
when you say that, it's easy to say fire them. But you know the question, obvious question will be who fires them? Who who takes that decision to fire them? As Shaka will tell you, and probably Carol will tell you, who makes that decision? The other persons who would have appointed them and also benefiting, how would they want to fire them? Look, I, I think some politicians uh, have to get some courage and have to take these people on. I mean, um, you know, Shaka Hislop has been a hero, not only on the football field, but he's also been fighting for this for at least the last 15 years. You know, has he got support? Has people come and said, you know, Mr. Hislop, we're going to back you. We're tired of our teams underperforming. We're tired of our athletes being betrayed. So it's time for Caribbean politicians to stand up and say, enough is enough. We're going to back our young people. We, we, we got a little extension in time here now. So, Carol, let me revert quickly to you. So, I'm, I'm going to thank Professor Hill for this extension very much. So, Carol, here in all of this, knowing what you know about CARICOM, and I, and I want to say you're probably closer to CARICOM than many of us, therefore, how can we get to the leaders and let them understand they need to be active, not in voice, but in action? Well, they're going to be 50 next July. So I think as as they grow, I, I I think we can, I certainly can assemble a small team. I like odd numbers, so I'll get three or five of us. And we make we make a bid to CARICOM to, to reinstate the sport unit and take it from there because they've they've dropped cricket, they've dropped sport, they've done nothing where that is concerned. And sports is a big economic activity. It's I mean it's no longer a plaything. I mean I'm pun intended. Nice. But the truth is outside of agribusiness and things like technology, which are driving forces for economic activity, sports and entertainment are that. And, and, and I think we can make a bid to have a serious committee involved and we can rotate it. The truth is if we don't start getting any percentage of the sport, the sport industry pie, which is now closer to a trillion dollars, you know, with all the talent that we have that Professor Hill spoke about, we're 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 not gonna we're not gonna be earning anything at all. So Shaka, I, you know, as so we go, approach, I would reapproach Caricom. That's the short answer. Shaka, as we go and we're talking corruption and sport lessons and solutions for the Caribbean, and we know that Professor Hill and Carol Beckford are not watching the World Cup, unlike most of the world. We must still ask you here who is going to win the World Cup as I go. <laughs> Right now, right now, my selection, my selection is with Brazil. But, but let, let, let me just say, while, while I totally understand both Caruso and, and, and Dr. Hill's positions in, in not, not watching the World Cup, um, for me, the World Cup is about so much more than, than just the winner. And, and I've, I've had the good fortune of experiencing that here. I, I've only been here for, for, for a couple of days. I, I, I think there is... Um, a, 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 there is a value that nations and, and that, that nations and their, their fans recognize in seeing their team at the World Cup, a value that's been abused by, by FIFA and, and, and its administration, in, in all honesty. But just to put things in perspective, and, and you saw this in, in, in some of the pictures you got from, from the group stages, for most of the nations, they're here, their fans show up just to see their team play. They're not expecting them to get through to the knockout stages. They just want to feel, they just want to be a part of, of seeing their nation represented in the, in the sports highest stage and, and ask no more. I got here um, just to the end of the group stages. I, I, I arrived on, on Tuesday and pretty much went straight to see uh, Morocco, Spain at, at, at Education City, um, which, as, as everybody knows, Morocco won on penalty kicks. And as I am leaving the stadium, there are groups of Moroccan fans, families, young kids, through to, to aging men and women, in tears, in, in, in tears of joy. And I think sport, um, sport does that to you. And of course, football being my sport, I, 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 recognize, I recognize that firsthand. Yeah. So why we spend a lot of time talking about who wins and celebrating yeah. that, for me, I, I, my my greatest takeaway from sport is is how it fills how it fills fans with a sense of pride and a sense of purpose. 
Thank, thank all of you. And I think all of us agree sports is indeed something much more than anyone understands and very important to all you will. Much thanks to you, Shaka Islop. Much thanks to Carol Beckford. Much thanks to Professor Declan Hill. Much thanks thank to Tucson Boyce and all his technical team. It's been our pleasure here on behalf of the Caribbean Development Bank to bring you corruption and sport, lessons and solutions for the Caribbean. We just hope people are listening, not only hearing, but listening and taking action. Thank you all very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.